Okay, so I think we can, we can start. Uh, so uh, welcome everyone to this uh, final lecture of our PKU lecture series on mathematical philosophy in celebrating Bertrand Russell's year long visit to Peking University almost exactly 100 years ago. So it's my great honor to introduce our distinguished speaker today, Professor Kevin Kelly from Carnegie Mellon University. So Professor Kelly is a professor of philosophy and the director of the Center for Formal Epistemology at CMU. He got his PhD from University of Pittsburgh in philosophy of science and his research interests include uh, inductive inference, uh, causal discovery, learning theory, belief revision, epistemic logic, and uh, actually many more. Uh, and on each of these fields, he has made highly original contributions. Uh, in particular, in the past two decades, he has been trying to understand the bias towards empirical simplicity, or say, Occam's razor in scientific theories by using formal concepts uh, inspired by topology. And um, he discovered why Occam's razor works if we are trying to find the truth in science in the long run. So I think he will report today the latest uh, development of this uh, actually very high, highly <laughs> ambitious project, uh, which also connects to three themes of Russell's work as actually the title of his talk show. So personally, I think uh, Professor Kelly's work is one of the best examples demonstrating the vision of philosophy at CMU it's rigorous, it's interdisciplinary, it can be applied and it's highly relevant to our life and uh, every, uh, well, uh, philosophy, science, everything. It also demonstrates how mathematical concepts can be helpful in shaping our understanding in philosophy in a very meaningful way. Uh, so this talk will last uh, 90 minutes and then we have 30 minutes Q&A. Uh, since it's very important to understand the basics in order to understand the later fascinating uh, uh, results. So you are encouraged to ask clarification questions during the talk, especially in the first half. So you can either uh, raise hands uh, or let us know, uh, say by writing your questions in Q&A. Uh, okay, so without uh, further ado, let's welcome Professor Kevin Kelly. Thank you Professor very Kelly, much. The, the screen is yours. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, so uh, thank you so much, Professor Wang, for that lovely, undeserved introduction. Uh, and thanks, thank everybody for attending this uh, wonderful event. Uh, I'm so tremendously honored to be part of uh, an event honoring Bertrand Russell's centenary visit to Beijing. Um, of course, Russell was uh, a hero of mine when I was an undergraduate in philosophy and uh, that I would be doing this, I guess, never, uh, never even seemed to be a dream, but here it is. So uh, I, I deeply appreciate that everybody could uh, find time in the morning at an awkward, uh, awkward time uh, to give me a, a, a time slot that I could actually be awake in. So thanks everybody. Uh, I, I really do appreciate it and uh, uh, I'm deeply honored. Okay, so um, uh, that's my thank you. Here's the beginning of the talk. It looks a little like a German horror movie, I admit, but uh, <laughs> it's a bold design. Um, I wanted to have a title that sounded very Russellian and I think simplicity, knowledge and reality just couldn't be better. Uh, it might've been one of his titles. This is joint work with uh, my able associate Hanti Lin at University of California, Davis. Uh, I think you've seen him in uh, Beijing before and Constantine Janine, who's currently at the University of Tübingen. Um, and Here's what they look like. So I couldn't have done this without them. Uh, in, in a way, what this talk is, is a fusion of uh, Casey's work, my work, and uh, Hanti's work. Uh, 
in, into something that's simpler and more elegant than any of the three were. Okay, so Occam's razor. Uh, plurality should not be posited without necessity. This is what you'll find online. Uh, actually, Occam never said that. Uh, Aristotle originated it. And a guy named Hamilton coined the phrase Occam's razor. Uh, but we're stuck with it. You know, science has its traditions. And so Occam's razor is what it's called. I'll continue to do so. Um, the scientific razor is a little different. The scientific razor, uh, which has been instrumental multiple times in major scientific revolutions in the past. In fact, I think it's the uh, basically the one thing I learned repeatedly in graduate school in history and philosophy of science is the crucial character of the scientific razor, which is among several theories consistent with the data, choose the simplest. And then simplicity is some vague thing that involves entities, causes, mechanisms, parameters, non-uniformity, uh, and a grab bag of other things to the point where people think maybe it doesn't mean anything in particular at all. And then we've got another thing for our birthday boy, uh, Russell's razor. So uh, there's a celebrated passage in uh, Mysticism and Logic. That's a wonderful Russellian title too, Mysticism and Logic, where he says, economy demands that we should identify the thing with the class of its appearances. Okay, this is a very characteristic Russellian doctrine. And that he invokes Occam's razor for it is also characteristically Russellian. In fact, uh, you know, when this came up, the first thing I thought of is, oh boy, you know, I remember reading Russell, <laughs> Occam's razor was a big deal, but I never really went back and looked at it since I've been working on Occam's razor. And so this is a wonderful opportunity to just go back and see uh, how does Russell's thinking on this relate to mine. Okay, so here, here's my favorite puzzled guy. So Occam's razor, why, why Occam's razor? You know, we're philosophers, so we should care about that kind of question. And here's the way I put the why, okay? This is good old, here's another thing I love about Russell is that he's not afraid to use and mess around with the history of philosophy. The history of philosophy for Russell is there to be used, not just to be studied. And uh, that's, I think, the thing about Russell that I like the best. Uh, I try to emulate that, so here we go. I'm talking about data analysis and all kinds of things, but I'm gonna start with the uh, amino paradox. So if you know that the truth is simple, then you don't need Occam's razor as an inductive method because you just use deduction. I'm gonna make myself smaller, I'm the cursor now. Okay, so if you know that the truth is simple, you don't need an inductive method called Occam's razor because you just deduce the answer. But if you don't know that the truth is, system, is simple, if you don't know that the truth is simple, how could Occam's razor possibly help you find it? Right? How could a systematic bias towards simple answers find you truths that might not be simple? Okay, So either case looks bad. It looks bad in just the way uh, Mino's paradox looked bad. And then the final question we're going to look at is Russell's razor. Russell presents his razor after a discussion of the scientific razor in his essay, as if his razor gets support from the scientific razor. Should it really? Does it really? Is his razor the scientific razor? So we'll close with that if I can talk that long and your ears last that long. Okay, so that's the plan. So we're going to start section one, the context of inquiry. I love this picture. Notice that the path here is not straight. Scientific success is not a straight path. Uh, I think a lot of nonsense in scientific methodology results from the fiction that it is a straight path. So I chose the picture carefully. So in the context of inquiry, I'm going to start with a familiar oversimplification that there's a set of possible worlds. They're the possibilities that we need to worry about. Propositions are sets of possible worlds. 
So here are some examples of propositions. Uh, w is the set of all the possible worlds. And a proposition is true just in case in a world, just in case the world is a member of that proposition. So th the most simple minded setup for a classical semantics that you could possibly have. Okay, and the next concept is propositional information. This probably overlaps with things that uh, uh, Johann van Bentham said when he came. Uh, we're in agreement about that. So uh, propositional information, uh, an information space is a collection of propositions, which we're gonna call, right? The elements of that collection are gonna be called information states such that the vacuous proposition is the vacuous information state, so it's in. Uh, that's like the information state you're in when you start the inquiry at the beginning of the road. And then uh, the information states are closed under finite in intersection, which is an abstract way of saying that uh, we're studying settings in which information can accumulate. Now you might be in a setting where information cannot accumulate uh, for subtle reasons. Maybe, uh, you know, if you go into a pristine society and set up video cameras all over and corrupt the society, then you can't perform the next experiment, right? You've spoiled it. But it's a long standing, uh, uh, long standing sort of idealization in the study of induction that we're looking at cases where information can pile up and accumulate. Okay. So that's all I'm assuming. And then uh, I sub W is the set of all possible information states uh, that are true in W. So uh, uh, that's just looking at the true ones. So it's like all the true information states. The empirical information states are the ones that you can think of as the inputs to scientific inquiry, right? So this is, uh, think of it as input information. So we're gonna call that information space E for empirical. Okay, so one information space that we need is the empirical one, we'll call it E. And then think of that as like the information you get from observations. Okay. So I want to, that's the formal business, but there's a, uh, an interpretation of these information states, which is crucial to the way we think and the way we gloss formulas after, afterwards. So I want to point it out. The plenitude interpretation of the information space is that uh, for each true information state, diligent observation, diligent effort at collecting data will result in some information state in W that's at least as strong. Maybe not that exact information state, but diligence will get you at least that much information. Okay, so for every information state, diligent, for every true information state, diligence will get you at least that much true information if you keep pursuing your measurements. Okay, that's the plenitude interpretation. Uh, just clarification question. Oh, yeah. so, so in the picture, so uh, this E and F are just two uh, information states, right? Yes. Not this F is not the F you mentioned in this uh, last sentence. No, no, no. Actually, that's a good point because uh, the F I mentioned is the intersection. Yeah. Okay. Right. So you can see why the closure under intersection fits with the. Uh, mm -hmm. So in other words, the key point here is that information. Uh, you wouldn't make sense out of the plenitude interpretation unless the intersection rule is obeyed, because otherwise you might end up just not being able to get more information that falls inside of that one. Right. Okay. Good. So here's another thing. Uh, so I like to say that inquiry is pushed by empirical information and it's pulled by a question. It's got both a pull and a push. And for us, the question is just another information space. And the elements of that information space are called answers. So you can think of the empirical information space as information in or provided, and the question is information out or requested. Okay, and so 
What pulls inquiry ahead is the question. What pushes it along is the empirical information. And then there's an interesting interaction there. For example, is the pull too fast so that the push can't keep up? That's a way of thinking about what inductive problems are. If they uh, another, push, okay. Sorry, another clarification. Uh, again, about uh, your, your, your picture. So it seems from your picture that the, the questions are like a partition of the entire they space. Could be, they could be paradigmatically they are, but they don't have to be anymore. So they can overlap, right? They can overlap. So they can, do they need to cover the whole space? Uh, w is in, so they automatically do. Okay, okay. I right? See. Yeah. So I all see. they have to do is W is in and they're closed under finite intersection. Uh-huh. Okay. So that's a, that's a great economy because now we do that both for input and output and it makes sense yeah. for both. And then it makes the whole thing symmetrical. You've got the push and the pull. I like that picture. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, just, just to expand on what Yang Jing said one more time, uh, one of the things we want to do is to fold empirical estimation into this thing, right? Not just uh, choosing between theories. And so overlapping intervals would be interval estimation and that counts. That's a big improvement. Okay, so a problem is just a triple, it's a structure with a set of worlds and then you've got two information spaces on it. The first one you call the empirical information space and the second you call the question. But it's just a structure of two uh, information spaces. Very, we want this to be as elementary as possible so that we can focus on the interesting stuff. Uh, so okay. the problem is focus, uh, focusing on a particular question, right? So you, you don't- yeah, 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 it's always a particular question. Okay, okay. Of course you could have, you know, I mean, that's not written in stone. That's just the thing we're looking at. There's a question. Uh -huh. uh, if you had two questions, you could say, well, what is it that, to be addressing two questions? And then intentionally, it would be something like the, uh, the coarsest refinement of both right in the partition lattice so you can do that kind of stuff operate on on questions okay but the, but the, you implicitly assume that you know all the possible answers uh, right. not necessarily i mean uh, all all there has all it has to be is that the context determines a question it might be that the answers are uh answers that would be apt if you heard them mm -hmm. okay right okay i mean just yeah. because our semantics uh is laid out uh, under God's eye, it doesn't mean that the agents are, have that okay. access, okay. right? Yeah. Yeah. They just have to have dispositions that anchors this as what would satisfy them, okay? Okay, yeah, thanks. I get that uh, question from philosophers a lot, but you know, this is mathematical modeling. It's not a psychological model. Okay, good. Uh, now here's, here's a really easy one. Here's an answer. And it's verified by empirical information when the information entails it. So it can't be wrong anymore. And it's refuted when the information entails the contrary. Okay, so that's verification and refutation. It's the way the old philosophers of science used to talk. Okay, verification and refutation. Okay, now we're gonna combine verification and refutation with the plenitude interpretation of the model. And so that means that A will be verified in W just in case there exists an information state true in W that verifies A. Why? Because by due diligence, you'll get at least that much information and that will also entail or verify A, okay? So will be verified just means you're in an information state that's in A. Now, not every, you don't have to interpret this formalism this way, and often it isn't like in logics of effort. Uh, but since we've got the plenitude interpretation, the will be comes out. And so the proposition that A will be verified is true in a world just in case A is verified in that world. But that will be the case for any element of 
a verifying information state. So it's just a union of all the information states that verify A. Things become more elegant when you look at the proposition. And now we're gonna use calculus book notation and say it's that proposition where the dotted line means uh, that that's the edge of the union of all the information states that, that uh, verify A. Okay. Uh, sorry, another <laughs> clarification. Uh, again, about your picture. So it, it seems, I mean, it, at least in this picture, uh, you sort of assume uh, the the ver a is the same as a, right? You, no, 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 no. But it's not necessarily no, like no, that, right? No, notice there's green. Look, I mean, there's only so uh -huh. much pictures can do in math, right? Yeah, but, yeah, sure, sure. <laughs> but green, but but strictly speaking, I was careful to put the green under the dotted line, right? Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and so um, what that means is, well, actually, that's not what I should have said. What, what I really mean here is that this is like, if you're a topologist, it's an open, closed boundary, mm -hmm. right? So A, A, yeah, no, actually, I did it right. A is the green area, and then the ver A is what's to the left of the dotted line. So it leaves out what's under the dotted line, right? That's A stuff that's not in will be verified. But... Uh... Is it possible that uh, some part of A is not covered by any information state? Uh, oh, sure. Yes, yes. We're, we're getting to that. So that's crucial. Okay, that's yeah. crucial. Uh, actually, the blue part is also labeled as A, right? Uh oh, sorry. Sorry. That's a typo. Yeah. A is green. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. Okay. Um, This is the very next part, right? So suppose we've got a world where A will never be verified in W. What does that mean? It means that no information true in W verifies A. So think about this world. Every information state you get is split between A and not A. Okay, so this is a world that could be in A where you never get information that verifies A. Okay, that's a possibility. Nothing rules it out. And then it would look like this. Tighter and tighter information always grabs some of not A. So A is never verified there, but it could be that A is true there. Um, and then the proposition that A will never be verified is not ver of A. So what does that look like? That looks like everything, as it were, to the right of the dotted line set, right? So the dotted line set is uh, will be verified. And then uh, the complement of all that is will not be verified because we're classical. Okay. And so it's just the proposition not ver of A, which is that A will never be verified. It'll, A will never be verified. Why? Because it's the worlds that are like that. The set of all worlds that are like that. Now we get to the point, the problem of induction, the classical problem of induction is the proposition that A is true, but will never be verified. So we're going to introduce a modal operator induction of A, the problem of it. So that, that says you face the problem of induction for A. That's A is true and will never be verified. That's awful. So I wanted to put in pretty uh, beautiful negation signs and then the substitution thing must have dropped it. So I wish I had a big red pen. A and will never be verified. That's not. Big apologies on that typo. So what am I talking about? If you, if you don't do philosophy of science or uh, epistemology, it might all look technical, but look, the problem of induction is Hume's problem. So here's Hume talking about it. My experience informs me that fire consumed coal then, but it's silent about the behavior of the same fi fire a few minutes later. So fire will always, right? Fire will always consume coal, could be true and yet never verified. So that's the problem of induction. Right, no finite number of observations will ever fully verify a universal law. That's the problem of induction. So that's what we were talking about. Um, yeah, so the problem of metaphysics for A 
is, let me see. But the problem of metaphysics for A is uh, A is false, but will never be refuted. It's the dual problem, right? So uh, that's bad too. Um, so let's take a look at where they arise. The problem of induction for A is like the boundary of A where A is true. The problem of metaphysics for A is the boundary of A where A is false, okay? So on the boundary here, A is false, but will never be refuted because the data split one side or the other. Here, A is true, but will never be verified because the data split one side and the other, okay? So um, there are two parts of the boundary. The boundary is divided between A and not A, and then that gives you what philosophers of science call the problem of induction, the problem of metaphysics. And why do I say problem of metaphysics? Here's Karl Popper. Um, talking about it. What prevents Freud's and Adler's theories from being scientific is that they do not exclude any physically possible human behavior. So they could be false, but they'd never be refuted because they don't exclude anything. Okay, and then he calls such theories metaphysical. That was a common sort of way of talking back in Russell's day. So that's apropos of the topic. Verifiability. So A is verifiable uh, if and only if, however A is true, A will be verified. So A entails that A will be verified. That's verifiability. Uh, and what that means is that uh, the proposition that you face the problem of induction with respect to A is empty. That means you can tell a priori from a logical analysis of A uh, and uh, of the kind of data that you get, that you would never fall into the problem of induction. What does that mean? It means that if there's a boundary, it's all problem of metaphysics. It would be all blue. And refutability is the dual thing, right? So you're refutable just in case your negation is verifiable. And then that means that the problem of metaphysics for you is empty. So that means the whole boundary line is green, right? So if there's a place where the data never say one way or the other, uh, A is true, not false. And then here's a really cool uh, uh, concept. I, I would like to give a whole talk just on this. I call it verifutability. I coined that term in uh, my 1996 book. Um, it's something that, that uh, Russell and the positivists should have come up with, and then old philosophy of science would have been so much better than what it is. So A is verifutable just in case the problem of metaphysics for A is refutable. So it might be possible that A is false but never refuted, but if that is false, then it will be refuted. And then after that, A is refutable. <laughs> um, and so this is a really cool thing for anybody who likes modal logic. That's equivalent to the problem of metaphysics for the problem of metaphysics for A <laughs> is empty. And so let's see if we can get a picture of that. Uh, here's the problem of induction for A. Here's the problem of metaphysics for A. If the problem of metaphysics for the problem of metaphysics were non-empty, then this circle, this is the boundary between the problem of induction, and the problem of metaphysics. So this circle would have to be green, but it's not. So you're looking at a picture that uh, satisfies A is verifutable. And then here's a case where A is not verifutable because uh, the problem of metaphysics for A faces the problem of metaphysics at this green dot. The problem of metaphysics for A is the blue line. It's false at the green dot, but it'll never be refuted there because the data will always split between the boundary top and boundary bottom. We'll see why this is such an important concept in examples in a minute. Okay, now here's, this gets back to uh, uh, Yan Jing's question. Um, in a deductive problem, every answer to the question is verifiable. So there's no problem of induction. 
there's no problem of induction. Um, uh, I thought I corrected this. There could be problems of metaphysics, but there's no problem of induction. So that has to be corrected. Put a, put a strike through that if you can. There's no problem of induction. Just like you would, everybody would say that, right? If it's a deductive problem, then the question poses no problem of induction. Yeah, so that's exactly what we mean. Uh, and in an inductive problem, there's at least one problem of induction. So here's, there's no problem of induction anywhere. Those are all dotted boundaries, but here there's just one point that poses the problem of induction. I'll call that an inductive problem. So in other words, the, the special thing is to be deductive and any departure from deductive is inductive. Uh, and then I, I already lapsed into this kind of talk, right? Everything we were doing is topology. So A will be verified as the interior of A. Uh, it's not the case that A will be verified is not the interior of A, which is the closure of not A. The problem of metaphysics for A is the closure of A minus A, which is the frontier of A. That's less familiar, but uh, it arises in certain areas like uh, uh, algebraic geometry. Uh, the problem of induction for A is A intersection, the closure of not A which is the board called the border of A sometimes, although you've got to really, this is not totally standard usage. Uh, and verifiable just means open, refutable means closed. And if I had more space, I would have said that uh, I, that E and Q, right? The empirical, uh, the empirical base and the question are both topological bases. And so the open sets are, you close under a union. So our picture, here's the interior of A, here's the closure uh, of not A, here's the border of A, the frontier, the frontier of A, and the frontier of A. Uh, that's what we were talking about. So the message here is that topology is not something I'm imposing. This is what the philosophers of science of Bertrand Russell's time were doing. They were channeling topology in the terminology I just used, right? In terms of verification and refutation. We made it through the first one. So section two, simplicity. There's a beautiful sphere, right? The simplicity jumps out at you in this picture uh, uh, it, with, with all of the clutter in the background. So I think that's a nice way to get started. What is simplicity? Well, I'm just gonna, I'm going to propose something here, and then uh, instead of giving you an a priori justification, we're just going to have to look at examples to see why it makes sense. So this one will be motivated by examples. A is as simple as B in world W, if and only if W is in A intersection, the problem of metaphysics for B. So you can gloss that as saying you face the problem of induction from A to B in world W. So see, here's a world where A is simpler than B. So you can get data forever in this world. A is true in that world, but you always get information compatible with B. So no matter how long I wait to say A, the possibility could be B. I could be surprised later and find out B. So that's what we think makes A as simple as B or simpler than B uh, at W is that W will never afford you information that rules out B, but A is true at W. Okay, so uh, again, some- Yes, sure. Is it uh, A is at least as simple as B? Or, I mean, A can it's be better, it's better. You know, I said that as a reflex, but I, I'd yeah. prefer to say simpler than B. Uh, simpler for the than B, strictly yeah. simpler than B. Is, yeah. is it possible that they are equally sim simple? Yeah, you can get cycles. It's, it's, it's better to think of this as like uh, um, utility theory, where it's a strict, where it's a strict okay. order that could get screwed up, uh -huh. because it's also not transitive, so it's not even an order. Okay. It's a, it's a relation that in paradigmatic cases will be a partial order, but you need special assumptions for that. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. And okay. and it's always connected to the to the particular world, right? So yeah, so this is this is worldwide. That's it's a new economy. We didn't used to do that, but it's way better to do it this way. Mm -hmm. Because it, it, when people are talking about some theories, they 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 can just compare them without referring to the world, right? Yeah, they well they do if it's really easy, as we'll uh -huh. see. But if it's not really easy, they can't really do it because you can have one theory be simpler in one place. It it, it can mm -hmm. be local, okay. right? So you okay. can have one theory simpler than the other in one place, but then the reverse in another place. Mm -hmm. right. That can easily happen. So okay. I, I agree that there's a habit of usage that this is an order and it must be an order on theories, but uh, that doesn't hold up long when you start thinking about it. Mm, okay. Okay. And it causes irrelevant trouble too, in my opinion. So um, A is Occam at world W, just in case no proposition is simpler at W. Okay. So that's just no proposition at all. It doesn't have to be an answer to the question or anything. There's just no simpler proposition you could have said. And A is Occam given E, just in case no proposition is simpler at any world in E. Okay. Um, yeah. So here, it, it at least starts to become a relationship between A and E, right? So that's a propositional relation. It's much better to see an example. So suppose we have this paradigmatic question, Q is how many coefficients are non-zero? This is like a, a typical kind of model selection task is that you've got a pr parametric uh, formula and then you're trying to zero out coefficients. Uh, and then uh, E is going to be joint interval estimates of the parameter. So every information state is going in this parameter space is going to look like a rectangle. So this is going to be a measurement of the first parameter, and this is going to be a measurement of the second parameter. And the question is, how many of those parameters are identically zero? How many can we zero out? Um, and so what you get here is that uh, none of them are non-zero is refutable because if either one of them were non-zero, the measurements would exact would eventually pull away from the origin, and then this would be refuted. Okay, so that's refutable. Exactly one uh, parameter should be freed. That's the crosses, right? That's the uh, the axes, and then that's no longer refutable because it could be false because the truth is zero, and then it would never be refuted. So you, you have the problem of metaphysics from zero to one, right? So zero poses the problem of metaphysics for one. Um, zero has the problem of induction with respect to one, okay? So problem of induction and problem of metaphysics are uh, symmetrical there. Um, and so what do you get? You get that zero is simpler than one because the origin world is in zero, but never rules out one because any information state true in zero uh, is gonna pick up some of the axes. All right, so it gives you just, just what you want. Zero is simpler than one, one is simpler than two. For the same reason, for any point on the axis, uh, the axis is true, but doesn't rule out what's behind. So one is simpler than two. In this case, it's beautiful because it's transitive and you get a partial order, right? So all the usual things you'd expect because it's such a nice clean problem. Okay. Here's a little more detailed one, polynomial degree. So Q is what is the true polynomial degree? Um, e is finitely many inexact measurements of X and Y. So this gives a little more detail into what we we're doing before. So degree zero is a constant function. Here we've got uh, a finite set of joint measurements that uh, is compatible with zero. 
because you can run a horizontal line through it. Okay. Um, if that's false, you'll eventually get uh, a joint measurement that rules out all flat lines because there will be some slope, however small. Then zero is refuted. So zero is refutable. Um, notice that every constant function is a world in which zero is true, but degree one, proper degree one will never be refuted because you could always see a little bit of tilt later. Um, so once the flat line, right, once the constant line is refuted and you see the tilt, uh, now one has become refutable because the only way it can be false is if you see curvature. So if it's false from now on, it will be refuted. So it just became refutable. So see, verifutable propositions are these wonderful propositions that are not refutable, but however they're true, they become refutable. So it's just as good. And then I would like to say that's typical of scientific models. The typical thing for scientific models, the generic thing for a scientific model is to be verifutable, not refutable or verifiable. And it's just too bad that the history of philosophy of science didn't notice that. It's an elementary, uh, beautiful concept. So, okay, now uh, uh, we just got another square that you can't put any straight line through. Now, uh, degree one is refuted and so on, right? So that's how the theory is supposed to work. Um, and so that's the basics of the context of inquiry. Now we're gonna talk about methods and epistemic virtues. So this is something where we've done, so, the other stuff is all kind of old. This is new. So we're gonna adopt a really simplistic picture of a learning method uh, borrowed from belief revision theory, which is also simplistic in the same respect, that we've got information states going in and it produces propositions coming out. And then the proposition that comes out, we'll call its belief state. So think of that as like everything this learning method concludes from the data, not just the answer that it wants to give the question, right? So this is everything. So it might include things like its reason for thinking that there's a true answer. Okay, so it's really like the most simple thing you could do. It's just a propositional operator from information states to belief states. Both of those are propositions. Um, here's the most obvious method you could have when in information state E, your belief state is E. So we'll call that a complete deductive method, right? I just call it the, the deductive method. It doesn't forget the data, it notices the data and it concludes the data and that's it. Of course, it's concluding a lot more than the data because we're, we're talking about propositions. So it's concluding all the deductive consequences too, right? We're not even bothering to pay attention to that. So, I mean, that has a lot of virtues. That's why people love logic, right? This is a place where people love logic and uh, Russell certainly loved logic. He invented it. So gee whiz, we ought to pay some homage to it. What does it do for you? Well, one of the things that deduction does is it drops refuted falsehoods, right? So if you could do the proof right away, then you'd drop the falsehood right away. Um, um, so did I do that? that? That screwed up. So L of E, um, uh, yeah, L of E is not a subset of not E, exactly. And believes verified truths, L of E is a subset of E. So um, uh, it's like you're keeping up with the information given perfectly. Well, in terms of finding the truth and avoiding error, that's a good idea, right? You don't want to believe anything that's refuted you do want to believe what's been verified and you want to do it right away. So in terms of truth conduciveness, you want to do those. It's kind of like, of course, if you're told the answer, believe it. And it also has a wonderful property that it's infallible, right? It's, it's wonderful property that's infallible, namely that um, 
if you're given true information, which we're assuming you always are, that's what information is. So since W is an E, then W is always in the belief state that's produced from E, right? So it avoids error completely. It's infallible. That's great. Um, it also has the following property. It's truth retentive. That means it never drops the truth once it has it. So if its current belief state, right? If your current belief state is true, that's what that says, and you get more information than you currently had, that's what that said, then you don't retract your former belief state. You only extend it. Okay, so you don't give up true beliefs once found if you're deductive. Um, now that's not a typical thing that you hear as a feature of deduction, but um, uh, given Russell's concern for uh, fitting into the history of philosophy, uh, I think it's relevant to talk about this guy. So this is Socrates, right? This is Socrates and Plato's Mino. And there's a pivotal section at the end where uh, Socrates is talking about the difference between knowledge and true belief, which that's epistemology if anything is. So now this is an illustration, this is Socrates talking. Now this is an illustration of the nature of true opinions. While they abide with us, they are beautiful and fruitful, but they do not remain long and therefore they are not of much value until they're fastened by the tie of the reason. Okay, so for Socrates, it was a major epistemic consideration. In fact, the decisive epistemic advantage of knowledge over true belief that you don't lose it when you get more information, right? It doesn't fly away easily when you learn more. Uh, notice that picks up on themes from the Gettier paradox too. Um, in a way, that's what's happening here is that uh, Socrates is getting on to it, the Gettier issue. And I should mention that it's not the Gettier paradox, it's really Russell's paradox because Russell does the Gettier paradox quite nicely with a stop clock. The, cl the clock has stopped at 12. You look at it, it happens to be true. Uh, you don't know, right? So uh, this is another common point with Russell. Um, so here's another virtue, it answers deductive questions. So deductive methods answer deductive questions. So if the answer, if the deductive answer is true, then eventually there's a time after which the deductive method believes the true answer, right? Because the answer will be entailed by the data and further data will continue to entail it. So it answers the question if the question is deductive. So all of these things make obvious sense in terms of finding the truth and avoiding error. One of them is avoiding the error completely. Uh, one of them is that you answer the question, so you find the true answer. Another is that you get rid of falsehood, of refuted things right away. Uh, you pick up verified things right away and you never drop the truth, which is the thing you're trying to find. So um, all of that, I think, makes obvious sense in terms of uh, epistemology and truth finding. Um, and so to summarize, in deductive problems, deduction has these virtues. It drops refuted falsehoods, it believes verified truths, it avoids error, it answers the question and it retains the truth. So those are nice things that come along with being deductive. If you're a scientist, you don't care that there is formal rules written down. What is it that you get out of deduction? You get this. This is what a scientist gets out of deduction. This is why we care about it. But if the problem isn't deductive, then deduction doesn't answer the question, okay? If the problem isn't deductive, then deduction doesn't answer it because deduction will keep waiting for verification and it will never come, okay? So inductive skepticism. Avoid error, error is terrible, so don't answer the question. Give up on the question, walk from the question. That's what a good 
an epistemically good agent should do is avoid error. And so give up on the question. That's inductive skepticism. Well, you can do that. I don't have a proof against it, but I don't like it. Uh, and I don't like it because I see it all over the place. Uh, you get a foundational gap. So we all love the inductive questions. Uh, and we all hate error. And so this inductive skepticism is a recipe for scientific self-deception, I would say. Uh, and you see it all over in statistics and machine learning uh, methods that are fundamentally deductive in their justification, uh, being applied to questions and conclusions that the client of the study almost surely understands to be inductive. Um, and so there's a gap between the means and the ends. Uh, here's our approach. So uh, everything in philosophy has to have a little name attached to it so we can remember it. So there's a contextualist version of epistemology and justification that's already that already exists in the epistemology literature. So we're going to put a little spin on that and call it feasibility contextualism. So what is feasibility contextualism? Uh, the first step is Here's a context, a context of discussion, right? So we know that we know now from our linguist friends that 99% of language use is pragmatics and pragmatics depends on the context of utterance, not logic and truth. Okay, and then this is what a context looks like. So here's a question in context. So the linguists say that's a question under discussion. It shapes inquiry and relevance and all sorts of things, even grammatical things. Um, and here's a guy who says that question is hopeless and laughs at it. Okay, so what feasibility contextualism says is when you laugh at the question under discussion, you're not at the table anymore. You're out, leave the table, don't sit there and continue to laugh at what people are cooperating on. Um, commit to the question or leave the table. And if you're committed to the question, stay, right, if you stay, preserve as many of the virtues of deduction on the list as you possibly can for that question. So be as deductive as you can be, be as deductive as you can be. That's what feasibility contextualism says. Okay. Um, and then my friend Socrates said in the Mino again, something very, very similar to that. So uh, Mino gave the Mino paradox, which is an early version of inductive skepticism. And then in response, Socrates says uh, the following. He says, I'm not sure, I skipped this part, I'm not sure everything I said before is true in detail, but here's what I will say for sure, right? But that we shall be better if we think that we ought to inquire than if we indulge in the idle fantasy that there was no use in seeking to know that is a theme on which I'm ready to fight. Okay, so what he would fight is that it's better to engage with the question than decide with the skeptic and say, I'm scared. William James has some nice quotes of this kind too. So what William James says is that uh, the skeptic is like a general who loses the war because he can't risk a single cut. So let's look at how that could play out. Here's the list of uh, deductive virtues, right? Here's the list of deductive virtues. And the inductive skeptic says, give up on answering the question. Keep avoiding error and give up on answering the question. So feasibility contextualism says, do answer the question, be committed to answer the question. So give up on avoiding error. Okay, so the inductive skeptic is still going to have the stability, but at the cost of not engaging with the question, so out of context. Here, you've got a house of cards because you're not deductive anymore. Your conclusions could blow up at any time, uh, but you're engaging with the question, which is what we say you should do if you sit at the table. So, um, 
you don't have to just say, let's not care about error at all. If you can't avoid error altogether, you should try to eliminate it. So this is kind of a Karl Popper idea. If you get into error, you should do everything possible to get out of it again. So eliminate error. So here's the difference. The, um, the inductive skeptic says, just give up on the question and keep everything else. You're not forced to answer a question. Yeah, but then you've got to leave. If you don't leave, what you can do is answer the question and eliminate errors that arise because you're going to be fallible. Okay, so that's, uh, that's what we recommend. So what does error elimination mean? It means if the proposition is false, then eventually uh, L no longer believes A. And the thing on the bottom is <laughs> I didn't see that when I was revising the slide, sorry. That's nothing down there. If proposition A is false, then eventually L no longer believes A. Eventually, this is the difference between uh, the inductive virtues that I listed on the right and the deductive virtues, because the deductive virtue is that you have to eliminate error immediately. So we're allowing a time gap. Um, okay, and so here's the main, the first main result, the Occam necessity theorem. Theorem is an exaggeration because given what's come before, this is just a trivial little factoid. You know, it's gotten to be less and less of a proof and more and more set up. So suppose that your method L eliminates error, eliminates error, that doesn't mean it avoids error, it eliminates the errors it gets into and retains truth. Then in every information state, what it says is Occam. That's all you need. It's Occam at every stage. All it has to do is eliminate error and retain the truth. then it has to say an Occam answer at every stage. That is a proposition such that no other proposition is somewhere simpler. Okay, that's our first main result. Okay, and then I'm gonna show you the proof of it. We can look at it later if you like, but I think it's, if I explained it, I would just, I would just talk about some pictures and then I'm gonna give you the pictures, so that's better, okay? So the proof is just this little tiny thing, see? It has, suppose you avoid Occam's razor, suppose you violate Occam's razor, then elimination of error comes up in one step and retaining the truth comes up, so that's all I use. Let's see if, we, if I explained it, what would that be? Here's our example with the free parameters. So let's look at how this goes. Here's an Occam violation, it's obvious, right? So. Uh, zero is consistent with the data, and this guy says two. Okay, so that's an Occam violation. He says two when the data are consistent with zero. And everybody would say in this case, not just me, that zero is simpler than two. So by error elimination, there has to be further data uh, presented by the zero world in which he drops the false conclusion too. Okay, I show it as going back down to the true conclusion, but all we need is that he drops the conclusion too. Why? Because this data doesn't rule out two worlds. Why? Because two is more complex, right? Two is more complex than zero. Uh, and so whatever data you get from zero, is also compatible with two. So what does that mean? This blue world is a world where you had the truth, but you dropped it, right? The blue world is a world where you had the truth, you had the world, the truth at this information state, which is also an information state in the blue world. And then you get further information, which is also an information state in the true wor blue world, but you drop the blue conclusion, which is the truth. So you dropped it. Okay, so that's the simple logic of this. If you ever were to uh, violate Occam's razor, then uh, there exists a pair of uh, belief states in which you drop the truth. 
So if you want to be protected against dropping the truth and you uh, eliminate error, which you should, then you ought to be Occam at every stage. And Occam's sufficiency is that in typical inductive problems, some Occam method does achieve all the inductive epistemic virtues. We can give sufficient conditions. It's a little messy to get necessary and sufficient conditions because there's combinatorics about crazy, crazy simplicity orders. If they're the kind that you're thinking of, like a Boolean lattice, it's easy to show that you can get success. But uh, we've looked at some monsters, and so I don't have a back and forth theorem. Here's how it would go. Uh, Say the simplest thing compatible with the data, which is purple, if the data are compatible with purple. Um, if, the, if the truth is blue, you might first get this kind of information, right? And so you say something false, you say the simple one. Uh, then you're gonna get further information. At that point, you might say green because green is the simplest one compatible now. Uh, and then finally, uh, you get all the way up to blue because none of the simpler answers are compatible with the data anymore. So that's basically the, the simple minded way that Occam converges to the truth. And then not only does it converge to the truth, but it has all the inductive virtues. It notices verification, it notices refutation, it eliminates error, it finds the truth and it retains the truth. Okay. It has all of them. So by, uh, so what's the upshot? By feasibility contextualism, uh, if you use this Occam method, you get all the inductive virtues. If you ever once violate Occam's razor, you don't get them all. You uh, fail either to eliminate error or to retain the truth. Okay, so we survived three, now four. Uh, scientific realism. So this is a new part. Um, Yanjing, how are we doing for time? Is this, we're into the last half hour? Okay, got it. I'll speed up a little bit, but it, it'll, it'll be better because this is repeating what came before. So I like that picture, pulling the curtain back. Perfect illusions. So there's a snail about to eat the lady. Horrible. But the reality is it's a chalk drawing. Right, and you have to look at it at exactly the right perspective to get the illusion. So it's a fine tuned perspective. And then that kind of thing happens in almost every famous scientific revolution in history. So the, the first is the snail, but what about Ptolemy's epicycles? Maybe his epicycles are perfectly synchronized with the orbit of the sun, and then everything would look like the Earth orbits the sun. Or maybe this, this happened in the history of optics. Uh, Newton said that the ether would deflect particles of light so that they would end up looking just like diffraction patterns as though they were made of waves. So particles could be deflected by an ether in exactly the right way to make it look like there's wave diffraction. Or Kepler. Maybe celestial magnetism is fine-tuned to have exactly the same strength as terrestrial gravity, so you can't tell the difference. And then here's the one I'm going to focus on as a toy problem. Uh, maybe the morning star just happens to have the same orbital diameter as the evening star, so the Babylonians mistakenly thought that they're identical. Okay, so in each of these cases, you get something like the snail picture happening. It's possible that the complex theory is true in a way that you'd never, right, in such a way that you'd never detect the complexity. It would look perfectly simple, perfectly simple. So let's take a look at the, uh, uh, the morning star, evening star again, what it really amounts to. So, um, what we've got is identity versus equality. So uh, X and Y say that X strong equals Y means that X and Y denote the same natural quantity in nature. So like the, the orbital diameter of the morning star is the same quantity as the orbital diameter of the evening star because uh, there's only one star. So they're, 
there's only one diameter, right? That's why they're the same. But it could be that they're distinct stars that just happen to have the same orbital diameter. So equal means happens to have the same, uh, uh, they just have the same value for whatever reason, okay? So X and Y have the same value uh, or X and Y denote the same quantity in nature. So I, I hope that's a clear distinction, right? So denoting the same thing, that would be like a strong structural explanation of the equality. If there were an equality of two parameters in scientific theory, it would be a remarkable coincidence, right? Everybody would be looking for some explanation. So let's look at how the possible worlds come out. Here are all the worlds where uh, the two quantities are literally identical. So there's just one quantity, x equals y, and it could have any real value. So you get a line. And then here, uh, you have that the two quantities are not identical, so their values could be anywhere in the real plane, and they might just happen to be equal. Okay? So uh, there are worlds where they happen to be equal but are not identical. Uh, there are worlds where they aren't even equal, so they couldn't be identical, and there are worlds where they're identical, so the values can be equal. And I'm going to simplify that by saying these are the simple worlds. The simple worlds are where uh, the two quantities are literally identical. There are complex worlds where they're not identical. There are miracle worlds where they happen to be equal, even though they're not identical. Uh, and then there's D, which is the normal complex worlds that don't have a miracle. Okay, so that's just the difference. So again, the mnemonic is complex, simple, miracle, and difference. What do the information states look like? This is the key thing to uh, get used to. Is uh, any information compatible with the, the M line is compatible with the S line because they they have exactly the same values, right? And we're measuring values. So let me animate this for you. Whoops. Let me animate it for you. Um, boop. Right. So there's more information. And then maybe the information refutes the simple theory. It looks like that. Does everybody see how it works? Okay, so you get empirical equivalence. Corresponding worlds in S and M present exactly the same information states in this model. Um, so that's a big problem. That, that was a huge problem in the history of the philosophy of science, what to do about the perfect miracles in the corresponding worlds. So now I'm gonna start talking about uh, a way of thinking about that. Let's talk about uh, reality in terms of similarity, right? So think about like counterfactuals. Everybody nowadays thinks that there's a notion of similarity among worlds that's part of our underlying semantics for conditionals and other things. And now instead of talking about similarity, let's talk about arbitrary similarity because arbitrary similarity is very robust even though similarity is a mess. So the first thing that's clear is that S worlds, I, I think most people would say S worlds can't be arbitrarily similar to C worlds because they differ in terms of identity and non-identity of the quantities. So identity and non-identity of the quantities is a discrete difference in nature. It's a big deal, like there's two planets as opposed to one planet. That's discrete. Planets come in chunks, right? So S worlds can't be arbitrarily similar to C worlds, but worlds in M are arbitrarily similar to D worlds, right? Over here, everything is just like uh, Euclidean, to topo Euclidean topology because everything differs just by two real values. So what do we get? Um, the real similarity topology is just take the topology generated by the information states and add two open sets to them, namely S and C, because those two are separated. They're not arbitrarily similar to each other, so they're isolated in the topology of arbitrary similarity. 
So just take the empirical topology and add those two and close up. Now you've got the real topology for this problem. And then I think this gives some real insight into what people mean by data science as opposed to uh, um, real science. So a data science question is like this. Um, I'm just gonna ask about the values. I'm gonna estimate the two values, right? And what I care about is are the values equal or are they not? So the green answer is that the values are equal. The blue answer is that they're not. Uh, but notice that doesn't really cut reality at the joints because there's no dotted line around this, right? So this is just talking about the values of the things. It doesn't get it whether the, what the underlying cause of the identity is, which is that it's the same quantity. The scientific question does cut nature at its joints because it asks, are the two quantities identical or are they not? Okay. Um, okay, now, but we've got a new issue because no method can find the truth and even eliminate error in that case, right? So that's why this was a, a big issue. So now she comes back, she's the anti-realist. She says, oh, I get it, you know, now I'm not going to insist on avoiding error. I'm just going to insist on eliminating error. Uh, but you can't eliminate error in this problem. So just give up on answering structural questions, right? So we, we just, now we're repeating the same dialectic at a higher level. Um, so you can be an, a skeptic about it and say, just do data analysis, right? So just do data, stick with the data analysis question. You don't have to worry about the perfect miracles. Or you can do Russell's thing, which is to be an empiricist. So uh, identify observationally indistinguishable worlds. And then the problem collapses down like this. But notice it still doesn't cut nature at the joints because you're not asking whether the quantities are identical or non-identical. You're just asking what the values are. And you say, that's all there is to ask. Uh, so this is my picture of my old advisor, uh, Clark Gleemore, right? He was a scientific realist and he would answer, we have to have real structure. <laughs> we want causes and we want identi identity and we want explanation and we want to get to the root of things. That's what we signed up to do science for, not just to estimate things that are observable. Okay, so now we're going to do another round of feasibility contextualism. You're doomed to fail for answering the question or eliminating error, so better to fail over a negligible set of worlds. Uh, what is negligibility? I'm going to follow a very standard geometrical uh, way of proceeding, which is that uh, negligibility is a proper sigma ideal over W. So it's a collection of propositions that contains empty set is closed under subset because subsets of small things are small. Uh, it doesn't contain W because W should be big. And it's closed under countable union, which is uh, Tim Williamson was here. So this is an anti sorties a rather strong anti sorties assumption. You can't get from negligibility uh, to non-negligibility very easily. You need, uh, more than a countable number of negligible things to get up there. And so there are different concepts of this. There's a, a standard topological negligibility concept. So nowhere density uh, means that the interior of the closure is empty. It's hard to think through that in the few seconds I'm giving you, but uh, a way to think of it is that it's a similarity foam. So in Russell terminology, it's open holes all the way down. Right, so this is a set that misses open sets all the way down. So it looks like a similarity foam. So this is like similarity, the geometry of similarity. And then if your set is foamy, uh, that means it's kind of negligible. Now, unfortunately, nowhere density is not a sigma ideal because it, it doesn't satisfy the closure under countable union, only finite union. So you say that a meager set is a countable union of nowhere dense sets, and now you've built in 
the closure under accountable union. Uh, and so this is one standard uh, concept of negligibility and analysis and geometry, and it's topological. So in terms of topological negligibility, what do you get? You get that S is non-meager and you get that M is meager. Uh, why? Because every open set that catches M, right? Every information state that catches M uh, has an open hole that misses M. Why? Because M is sitting, it's immersed in the plane. And so the plane has open sets that have holes in them that miss M. Over here, no. Uh, you've just got a line and you've got an interval on the line. So by the bare category theorem, that's not meager. Okay, so uh, you don't get negligibility over here, but you do get negligibility of M over here. Uh, another thing you can do is say, um, hey, the bubbles could still have some weight or some uh, volume, right? They're not nothing. So let's talk about volume. So negligibility of A is zero volume of A at the dimension of A and W. Uh, now, you might say, okay, that's no good because look, in our problem, M and S are both lines. So they both have zero volume. But remember, you've got to always assess volume at a dimension. And so there's a question, which dimension do you calculate the volume at? Um, and then there's a really interesting paper by a guy named John Deaver, you can get online, uh, local Hausdorff measure. So his problem is exactly sometimes the space, the underlying space that you're doing geometry in changes in dimension, maybe even continuously. And so uh, you ought to assess your volume at the corresponding dimension. And so what you get is a picture like this. What is the local dimension of S? Well, S is open in similarity space. The local dimension of S is one at every point in S, no matter how you do it, right? Every concept, every sensible geometrical concept of dimension is going to have that this is one dimensional in the neighborhood S because it's isolated from this other stuff and it's a line. Whereas over here, the local dimension of M is two because it's immersed in a plane. And so that gives you, that breaks symmetry between S and M. And what you get is M has negligible volume at its local dimension and S has non-negligible volume at its local dimension. Okay. So what's a problem? <laughs> a problem is just a problem that's augmented with a sigma ideal of negligibility. Um, and I'm gonna put two dots on everything that's associated with negligibility so that we don't have to clutter our notation. So E is a subset of A just in case uh, the counterexamples are not too many. E is identical to A just in case the symmetric difference is not too big. And uh, the dotted version of collection A is just all the things that are identical to elements of A. So it's all the nearly A things, okay? So now you can verify and you can refute by nearly entailing and by nearly refuting. Okay, so this is cool, right? How many times have you heard in philosophy, I don't care about a single counterexample. It's gotta be like a significant amount of counterexample, right? So that's what we're doing, just put the dots on. And we've got, what do we mean by significant? We've got a sigma ideal sitting in the structure. So we just refer to that. We'll be verified. Uh, that's just the union of all information states that verify A. See, that's exactly the way we define interior. Uh, nearly a topological, and it's a nearly a topological interior operator. Look at this. These are the Kuratowski uh, interior axioms. You just put dots in the right place on the relations and they come out valid. Uh, 
And then you get the, the problem of induction and the problem of metaphysics. This is really cool because these problems are, are worse problems than the standard problems. The standard problem happens in one world. This says, uh, this says that the data are not just going to give some other possibility as a possibility. They're going to give a lot of possibilities alternative possibilities as a possibility. So these are bad problems. Uh, and then you can just keep doing it, right? So like verifiability, et cetera. Here's a theorem. A is verifiable, which means it's, it's nearly an open or verifiable set, just in case it's pro problem of induction is not nearly empty. It's exactly what we had before, but dots in the right place. And then you've got Ukum's razor. Ukum's razor is that A is simpler than B, given E, if and only if. The same thing we had before, but with the dots, and then it's significantly big. Right? So that says that it's problem of, right, that the witnesses for its simplicity are non-negligible. And ukum given E means no proposition is simpler given E. Okay, so you're gonna need to refer to the slides a little bit to, you know, I, I realize, but the take home message is that this looks just like what we did before, but with dots. So the negligibility business has been folded into the topology so that you don't see it anymore. And here we go. Occam necessity theorem extended to miracles is suppose that L eliminates error. That means it, it only fails to do so in a negligible set of possibilities and retains the truth, which means it only fails to retain the truth in a negligible set of possibilities. Then at every stage, the method is Occam. Okay, so this is a way to do Occam's razor for realism and miracles. And because the conditions are all folded into what uh, simplicity means, this is actually a tautology. It doesn't require any material assumptions about the problem, almost none. It's just like an analytic truth if, for, uh, for our friend Bertie. Um, there's the proof again. Here's how it really works. So I violate Occam's razor. So here I've got something compatible with S, but I say C. So that turns out to be an Ukum. Yeah, you know, I don't have my dots here. I'm supposed to put dots. This is an Ukum violation. Why? Because there's a significant set, right? This is non-negligible set that is. Um, that has the problem of metaphysics with respect to C because it's compatible with all of that stuff over there, right? So it grabs a lot of stuff in which it's false and it's also non-negligible itself. There's two sides to this. So that's an Ukum violation. Um, but now you eliminate error, right? With two dots. Um, so since this is non-negligible, you have to eliminate error in at least one, say that one. So the non-negligibility here allows me to say that you eliminate error in at least one of those worlds because you can't ignore all of them. You've got to fix some of them. So take that one. So there's going to be further information about its doppelganger world, right? Right. So you're going to get further information about this doppelganger world uh, where it says S. Right? So this information is information where you, you get S because you've got to eliminate error in S and all the data are the same if you're in S. Okay, so that, that goes through. Um, and now the last shoe to drop is that you drop the truth in a non-negligible set, namely F intersection C, which is that square. And that square is non-negligible because it's got area in the plane. Okay, so that is how uh, the logic of the argument works.
Um, so uh, this is, I'm going to toot the horn. That's the only, at least in my knowledge, that's the only available non-circular justification of Occam's razor that mandates it in structure, stru structural inductive inference at every stage. Uh, so Bayes factors, that story doesn't do it. The Vapnik theory doesn't do it. Pack learning doesn't do it. AIC, those kind of estimation rules don't do it. I don't know of any alternative foundation to the one I just meant, mentioned that will justify, uniquely justify Occam's razor as a necessary condition for inquiry in inductive inquiry into structural truth. Okay, so it's just the thing you want to tell a pretty story about what scientific revolutions in the past were all about. Um, so I'm out of time, am I? I got, if you can, if you well, can handle five minutes, I can actually yeah, finish five minutes. back to Bertie. Yeah, 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 yeah. you're not. Bertie, okay, so this is the last section. I, I almost made it. So uh, Russell's razor, what do we have to say about Russell's razor? We got to say something about Bertie because it's his party. So here's what he says. By the principle of Occam's razor, if the class of appearances will fulfill the purposes for the sake of which the thing was invented, we should identify the thing with the class of its appearances. Well, that's a bunch of hedging, isn't it? If the class of appearances will fulfill the purposes for the sake of which the thing was invented, uh, then we should identify it with the class of its appearances. Okay, so that's a mouthful, but we've got the stuff on the table to, uh, to make a clear semantic sense of this. Your purposes are Q, that's the information demanded. That's my purpose, I'm interested in the answer to Q in context, and the appearances are E. Okay, so he's really talking about the interaction between Q and E here. Um, now let's go back to our example. If you ask the structural question, if that's what interests me is a structural question, are those two planets identical? Uh, then the class of appearances doesn't fulfill my purposes because I wanna know if they're really identical. And then uh, that cuts across the appearances. So by his own statement, Russell's razor is void in this case. If, I, if I'm interested in that question, I don't have to do his razor because it doesn't fulfill my purposes. Okay. So this is kind of a big zero. If you're a realist, then Russell's razor doesn't say anything to you. Um, now, if you do ask the data analysis question of, you know, are these two values equal, then all that matters to you is equality, okay? So since that's all that matters to me, I may as well identify S with M. Sure, yeah, I'll, I'll grant him that. There you go, I did it, boom, see? That's what Russell wants you to do because we're identifying them with their set of possible true information states. That's this quotient. That's what he's telling you to do. I agree with that. What's wrong with that? But that's not even an inference. That's not an inference. It's just a matter of eliminating irrelevant junk in a semantic model of inquiry. That's all it is is a matter of eliminating irrelevant detail in the underlying model theory. Why, why would you carry around an equivalence relation that represents identity of quantities if you don't care about it? Just use the forgetful functor and drop it. Uh, but now suppose he, he doesn't, but suppose you were to ask whether there is such a thing as literal identity beyond equality. Um, then you get this, you get the old problem we had where every world has a real identity relationship in it that may hold or may not. And then you get these new worlds where you drop that out. So which of them are right? All you've done is made the problem way worse, right? Because now, even my justification of Occam's razor doesn't choose between these things because this is a non-negligible set of miracles with respect to this square, right? These two squares are indistinguishable, but they also 
neither of them are negligible. So now you've just made the miracle non-negligible, right? It's going to be everywhere dense. It's going to have mass, whatever you want. Um, and then it looks like Russell was smelling something like that because uh, he plumps for the harmless semantic modeling interpretation right after that. So he says, it's not necessary to deny a substratum under, right? you don't have to deny that there's such a thing like real identity underlying these appearances. It's merely expedient to abstain from asserting uh, that that's an unnecessary entity. So what does that mean? He says, you're not inferring, right? So you're not even answering this question. You're not taking that route. All you're doing is simplifying the model and then not asking about the stuff you projected out. Okay, and that's it, we survive. Maybe not in one piece, but thank you very much for being so patient with this long harangue. And, and also I apologize, I tried, I thought I had all the uh, typos out, but this is a new talk and I didn't get them all out. I'll fix it for you so it can be distributed without the typos. Okay, okay, thank you so much. Um, okay, so uh, we, we got quite, still quite some time for questions. Uh, so please, if you have questions, you can show me, you can write down or you just show me by raising hands in the panel. Uh, so Gigi, Gigi has, uh, yeah. Oh, hi, Kevin. Uh, hi, good to see you. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, very, I mean, as usual, uh, fascinating talk. Thank you very much. And um, um, so my first question is this, uh, it's a matter of clarification. So you have that session on scientific realism. Um, but in the end, it seems you're just saying that your story can be sold to both anti-realists and realists. Is that really the moral? So for, for anti-realists, your, your theory can be just done right, without the dots. And for, for realists, you, you need the version with dots uh, and you can sell that to them. But in the end, uh, so at least, I mean, as far as this theory is concerned, of course, it, it seems to be neutral regarding the scientific realism debate. Right? Does it bear on that debate at all? Uh, Oh, I, I think it does because, you know, let, let's go back. Um, so, so two things I want to say, Gigi, uh, because you, you touched on something that I think is interesting and should be emphasized, is that it's not like two different things. Uh, so feasibility contextualism mandates the non-dotted case when it works. And then it only allows for the dotted case when the non-dotted case doesn't work because it, it's Feasibility contextualism is always the same view. Uh, engage the question or get out of the room, right? It's okay to leave the room, but if you're in the room, don't sit there making faces, engage, right? And then when you engage, you should engage in the best possible way. So um, it's two parts of the same story, right? So if, and then that's important because uh, you don't wanna say when you're doing data analysis, See, what if I did the dots when you're doing data analysis? Then the simple theory is negligible. And so it's already refuted in the double dot story. So you'd be mandated to say the complex theory a priori. We don't want that. Okay, maybe I missed that part. But, okay. that, but that's not, well, I didn't say it, but you know, that's why I wanted to emphasize this, right? So well, I, I, thought, I thought the story is uh, if you're doing data analysis, then you don't need the more complex uh, version of the theory with it's, dots. It's not only that you don't need it, it's that you're- structural inference, then you need, uh, you need uh, 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 the more complex theory. So yeah, that's what I thought uh, uh, the story is uh, for, for people who don't want to engage with the, uh, the, the uh, scientific realist uh, question, then, uh, then they can just do with uh, I mean, if they want a story about outcomes razor, then the story can be told in the non-dot version. Uh, but for scientific realists, right, they're, they're engaging more complex problems. So then uh, in order to give them a kind of outcomes razor, then it's the more complex version, uh, that the dots version. So, um, but now you are saying actually, um, 
so it's not a matter of the DOS version re being reduced to the non-DOS version in some cases, rather is sometimes you just have to, yeah, that part I actually didn't get. Uh, so wh why do you say that uh, if I, if I use the DOS version in the data analysis case, then I somehow will be in trouble? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just said it. You, you'll be in big trouble because oh, okay. uh, because then uh, um, the simple theory, right? So like constant as opposed to quadratic will be negligible. All those things will turn out to be negligible. I see. Okay. And so, and so, and so in, the, in the dotted that? theory, uh, a negligible theory is already refuted with dots. So you shouldn't okay. say it. No, I, 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 I thought negligibility is just the allowance, right? It's a, it's a, it's to say, yeah, you're allowed to, to fail there, but it doesn't say somehow. So okay, maybe I, I still need to look into the details here. I, I thought negligibility is just to right, give, give someone. Uh, 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 some leeway room so that right you don't have to succeed uh, in those negligible cases. Uh, but of course, you can succeed there. That's 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 all fine. You um, could do you could do it that way, but I think you start to get into issues about what is what is dotted Occam's razor when you're neglecting stuff, right? So uh, uh, okay. one of the one of yeah. one of the curious problems you get into is what if I foregrounded M. I'm a mm -hmm. realist, but now I foreground M, just like we're doing because we're philosophers and we always like to foreground the miracle. Scientists never do, mm. right? That's a different question. But now I foregrounded something negligible. Mm. That negligible thing is simpler than, than D, right? So, so M is simpler than D. Uh, but it's not simpler than D because it itself is negligible. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Okay, um, and so what you want is always to say uh, uh, it should be the, the strictest thing that the question will bear. Mm. Okay, then... Uh, so this this seems to be a stronger stronger requirement uh, than uh, what Hanty had in mind. I thought. Um. Well, uh, it's a little it's a little different in certain respects. Uh, for for one thing, it's that um, uh, Hanty Hanty I think didn't have our interest in this being a completely general way to uh, topologize almost sure reasoning. Mm. So that the whole of topological learning theory looks exactly the same with all the sequential forcing, with the you know the positive convergence arguments, everything is in one package, and you don't even feel it because the form of the arguments is exactly the same. And what you get is these non-negligible errors popping out, right? Mm -hmm. Non-negligible non failures. So to me, uh, to me, like the real challenge for this kind of thinking, the, the reason it wasn't getting traction in the broader community is that diagonal arguments and, you know, this kind of topology was only generating worst case objections. And Bayesianism would, it would tolerate, you know, lots of trouble as long as it's measure zero. And then you start to say, well, hey, you know, if, if, if it's the probability measure doing everything and the topology reasoning isn't doing anything, then just get rid of it and let's get to business and write a lot of probability formulas that don't look anything like this, right? You're not helping. Uh, well, I like to think this does help it. Look, look at all that stuff. I mean, it's, it's like baby philosophy of science concepts. It would be way better if we could understand real data analysis and real scientific inference in those simplistic terms. And then if you dot it in the right way, it absolutely does. And you're doing almost sure reasoning at the same time. Where did you see an ugly formula with uh, probabilities on the outside? Not in the whole presentation. Well, well, in the end you talk about volumes. So that gets close. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's not in the reasoning, right? That's just a, no, 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 that's not part of the theory because that's just motivating. That's one Sigma ideal you could have chosen. 
Well, I thought that's the one you you have in your. So uh, that's your conception of negligibility. No, or no, just no, the no, one no, one no, example no, of a conception. Just an example. It's just an example. I don't want to say because you know. It, if, uh, if I said any single one of those, there'd be a Teddy Seidenfeld in the audience who would have a, a deadly objection because geometry, when you get down to it, is kind of a mess. That's what I learned in the I fall see. is that geometry, you know, if, if there's somebody who knows geometry in the audience, whatever you plump for, you're gonna get killed. <laughs> okay. So I decided to forget, forget that, let them choose it. And just do all the reasoning and you know at the same level of generality as the information. Information is just this structure that has a minimal closure properties, right? Do the same thing with negligibility. Now you're that's mm -hmm. going to be the core. And then guess what? I mean, everything comes out to be like two line arguments. So I, I mean, to me, that's the sign that uh, philosophy is headed in the right direction. When when the long proofs with lots of technicality start to disappear and all you've got is a certain shape that's held there on the page by some nice modal composition, then you're getting somewhere in philosophy. That's what I want to do. That's what the dots do. I use the dots on purpose because I wanted that to have the absolute minimum typographical uh, profile on the page. Thank you. Um, and then, yeah, so thank you for uh, Clarifying right. this, uh, and then and then you said there's also bearing on the and, and the scientific realism debate itself. Uh, so so I mean, because just now you're just trying to uh, clear my confusion about uh, how how I understand the difference between the dots version and non-dots version. Uh, so I, I'm also wondering whether this theory or, or whether something coming out of this uh, this whole framework uh, sheds some light on the debate between scientific realists and scientific anti-realists. Yeah, yeah, okay. So let me just. Well, Dara, just clarify. Apparently, it didn't for you, but it did. It did for me. <laughs> so let's go back here. Uh, uh, this is the anti-realist, right? Right. There she is. That's what they say. You know, this is uh, Boss Van Frossen. Right. Right. He would say exactly this. Uh, and then these are a, some of the standard responses the anti-realists give to what she just said, right? So there's this one and this one. Right. So, so, so this is a and way to- And of... then the scientific realist rejects all of that. He wants real structure, right? So we did respond because by doing this maneuver, we say, if you care about the structural question, then you're in a context where you, you don't walk away from that question. You either walk from the question or you stick with it. If you stick with it, you do, you come as close to deduction as you can. Okay. Right. Well, you can't come as close as we did before because she's right. You can't even eliminate error anymore, but you can at least fail negligibly. Yeah. Okay? So yeah, to me, yeah, of course, this is very illuminating. This uh, for me is a very good clarification. Or, or say reframing of the debate, uh, but in the end, uh, you don't seem to rec make a recommendation whether I should be a scientific realist or anti-realist. So that's just personal taste. Oh, uh, so oh, oh, if, oh. I, if I care about structural problem, then that's my own taste, and if I don't, then that's a, that's also equally reasonable. Uh, yeah, exactly. Because what we're doing is we're saying uh, uh, question under discussion is part of the context of inquiry, part of the context of discussion, right? And so you're just not in that context if you reject the question. So okay. it's not an option. It's not an option to sit at the table and reject the question and laugh at it. Mm. You know, to put some meat on that, I'm a physicist. I'm at you know, I'm at the Higgs boson conference. And I raise my hand and say, don't you know that these are all inductive inferences you're talking about? Mm -hmm. You know, and then I, and then I start uh, uh, filibustering and won't let anybody else talk. I'm going to get booted, right? That's not respecting the context. You know, I'm not a physicist anymore. I'm a philosopher when I start to do that. And that's what they'd all say. Go, go to the philosophy class, you know, get out of here. We're talking about the Higgs boson. So I'm thinking okay. like that, right? So that carries. So, so that's why I feel right. So you can be friends with uh, both sides, and uh, it, 
Yeah, but I guess, I mean, the realist could be friendly with an anti-realist who just doesn't care about anything but what the values of variables are, <laughs> right? That, that never was the problem. The problem was always, could you be a realist? And that's what this addresses. Okay. And, and if you're a realist and you have these miracles, what validates your method of searching through models by Occam's razor, right? So this gives a, a unified package for that. So obviously faithfulness and fishing for DAG equivalence classes is one application for this. Yeah, good, thanks. Okay, so other questions? Actually, I, I, I have uh, quite some questions, but let me ask the first one. So I, I really want to uh, understand better about uh, the structure induced by your simplicity uh, definition. So you, you mentioned that this is not a usual order, right? So it, can you have uh, two, uh, I mean, simply so-called simply, uh, well, theories which are not comparable according to the definition, so. Yeah, you can have that. You can have that. I, yeah, so, I had a bunch of slides on this that uh, that would have been, but obviously things were getting long, so I hid them. Uh, sure. They're in the background. So here's here's a couple of things that can happen. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I I love this example. So suppose you're right. Suppose we got two paradigms. There's the polynomial paradigm, like the one I showed, but there's also a guy who, who's. Uh, uh, my colleague is in ecology and he thinks everything is uh, is composed cycles. So he's right. So he does periodic functions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the periodic polynomials and the polynomials are both, uh, they both have the property that they're compatible with any finite data set at all. Mm -hmm. Right. So, I mean, <laughs> both of them are as bad as Popper. Uh, could ever complain about because they're both consistent with everything. And now we're having a debate. Is it periodic or is it not, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, okay. Uh, so what happens there is if you run it through this theory, uh, the polynomial one, now suppose I ask not only for the, for which of those two paradigms it is, but what degree is it in there, right? Is it a degree N polynomial or a degree N periodic polynomial? Uh, then what you get is the polynomials are linearly ordered by simplicity. The polynomial degrees are linearly ordered and the periodic polynomial degrees are linearly ordered and you've got two side by side uh, linear orders that aren't connected. Okay. And in fact, they're both, uh, uh, they're both strict partial orders. Okay. In that case, it's transitive. Everything is vanilla, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, but, but it's interesting that case because at every stage, what you do is knock out finitely many of each of those two linear orders. And so you've always got two simplest at the bottom, which answers your question. You always have oh, right. it. You okay. always have it. So that mm -hmm. gives a nice interpretation of what Lakatos was talking about in his uh, uh, philosophy of research programs. Mm -hmm. he, was, he was really talking about rules for adjudicating between the simplest guys when they're always uh, multiple simplest guys and you never get rid of them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So one rule you could have is which one was originally ranked lower in terms of complexity. That that's what he attributes to Popper. His rule was look at the one that's made more prog right? Avoid the one that's had more refutations of, uh, of levels recently. Okay. So both of those will converge to the truth and both of them will have all of the... Uh, They'll both answer the question. Uh, they'll both retain the truth and have all the other virtues, even though Popper said that uh, those questions are garbage because they're metaphysical. Mm -hmm. I see, okay. So that, that's one example. Another interesting yeah. example uh, that just came to my attention, so I'm not sure what to think of it, it's funny. Uh, I mean, we always thought of these partition questions. This goes back to your original question about the talk, yeah. right? So we always originally said partitions, but that makes it look like there's this model, that model, and then estimation is not part of this, right? So estimation is totally like some other thing you do. 
And I guess we were misled by uh, methodological practice that way because that's the way statisticians always think of it. But no, I mean, in this formalism, the question doesn't have to be a partition question, right? It could be a bunch of overlapping intervals. And then that's what quantitative questions look like. Mm -hmm. So here's a, here's a nice thing. So this is a quiz for everybody. If I had two open intervals on, uh, on X, right? So we've got a one quantity X and I got two overlapping intervals. So picture two intervals says neither one contains the other, but they overlap, okay? So like the ge general condition. So what can we say about, uh, uh, what do we say about the simplicity order there? So think about the endpoints of the two intervals. So here's what happens. The one that's underneath the other one, right? So if, if you've got two intervals, they overlap. So one has an endpoint that's contained inside the interior of the other one. Yeah. Then the one in the background is simpler at that point. By our definition. Oh, okay. So that means if your problem is the estimation question, which has all the possible uh, rational endpoint intervals in it, then any two overlapping ones are, are ordered by simplicity. It's a huge mess. And so now that, that makes you worry. So you can also have, uh, it, it also is the case that any subinterval, any proper subinterval is more complex than the super interval. Yeah. Isn't that interesting? Um. So here's what happens. How do you get that tangle to go away? Well, think about the interval that is exactly the measurement, right? The interval measurement is the input data. What about that interval? It's the only one of those that's simplest because now it's the whole space and so it's closed. So it's refutable. Okay. It's refutable because it's the whole space. So what, so it turns out that not estimating, not drawing a conclusion about a parameter uh, that's stronger than the measured confidence interval is an instance of Occam's razor on this theory. Hmm. But now here's an interesting thing that then you say, well, hold it. If you can't go beyond that, then how do you ever do anything like infer that a quantity is exactly equal to another or is exactly zero? Mm -hmm. Ah, but that's when the question has that as an answer in. Mm -hmm. And the interval question doesn't. Okay. Well, so it does, it okay. does all that stuff. I mean, whoever heard of those two topics is the same topic even. And I wasn't fishing for it. I just noticed last week that this stuff about intervals is literally an instance of Occam's razor, which, you know, it certainly wasn't something I designed into the system. It was at first an embarrassment to me when I saw all that tangle. It says a nice thing about <laughs> logic. <laughs> uh -huh. I see. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I guess for some... uh, Kevin, just to, uh, uh, do, do you mind uh, uh, clarifying yeah, sure, sure, sure. a point there? Uh, yeah, very interesting question and answer. But what, what do you mean by a measured confidence interval? I, I actually got that part was confusing. Uh, Okay, yeah, yes. I mean, remember, uh, we, we've got this metaphor. So the, uh, uh, we're really talking about propositional information. So at this level of limping along, we're assuming that you literally are doing uh, bounded but uncertain error, not, not random error. Okay, I see. Right? Clark no, Lemore had a paper on that, right? So in engineering, they do that. They say, look, I mean, frankly, they have a point because look, uh, I've got so the measurement little... comes with the interval. So yeah, 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 yeah. I, yeah, I mean, look, uh, the sophisticated thing is supposed to be normally distributed error, but whoever thought that uh, you could be a light year off with a six-inch ruler? Mm. I mean, there's no possibility that's going to happen. Nobody's going to be off that far. I mean, even if they went insane. Mm -hmm. um, and so 
you know, there are bounds on measurement error. And if you look at manuals on it and you look at how high school students are taught, uh, it's all in terms of like, is it between these two notches? So I'm thinking of it like that. Okay, I see. So data comes, comes in as intervals. As and intervals, then... right. Okay. And so the strongest Occam hypothesis, the strongest Occam answer to the interval estimation question is exactly the interval that came in. And anything stronger is not Occam because it's more complex. That's, that's the new thing I noticed. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks. Okay, since we are actually running out of time, but I, I think I have to ask this question, actually going back to uh, the theme of the uh, <laughs> lecture series. So, okay, so, so you use um, those concepts of uh, topology uh, to sort of uh, clarify um, the uh, philosophy of science concepts, uh, but it, it, it seems to me that in the end, I mean, the, the, uh, this necessity theorem uh, doesn't rely on any deep uh, topological kind of uh, knowledge or, or, or uh, results. So would you say, uh, uh, comment a little bit more about how, uh, and how topology play a role in the whole kind of uh, work? Yeah. yeah, thank you very much. That's a great question, uh, as all of them have been. Um, so, uh, and, and I love that question too. So uh, in, in the paper on this I'm writing, uh, I thought about this and, and to tell the truth, I didn't emphasize it here because the talk is already so complicated. But of course, in the paper, uh, I was very interested in your very question. So um, I carefully traced every time an axiom was used. And the axioms of topology show up in the formal uh, results almost not at all. Okay. In, in, in the Occam necessity theorem, it really is a tautology. Mm -hmm. And that made me reflect a bit like uh, I always was taught, you know, modern structural mathematics is that the axioms are everything. And then, uh, you know, uh, the, the right family of transformations determines even the reality of what you're talking about, right? And so then it looks like a disaster if your result is just a tautology based on definitions because there's no structure to it. Um, and so maybe I felt a little bad about that, but here's kind of a counter, counter punch against that whole way of thinking about mathematics. Um, after this exercise, what I'm starting to think is that most of what's topological about topology is the topological operators and their special definitions. And those operators make sense far more broadly uh, than in topology. Um, they make sense on any, any set structure, right? So what is a topology? It's a it's a set of worlds and then a collection of propositions on them. So call that a propositional structure. So interior and closure make perfect sense in any propositional structure. And then the reasoning looks topological. And in fact, a lot of the most useful facts about interior and closure are just consequences of the definition. Um, and then the extra stuff really doesn't show up that much. So like closure of the topology under a uh, finite intersection, the only time you really use it is in the positive arguments that you're gonna get more information that tells you this and you can accumulate it. It doesn't have anything to do with the negative arguments at all. That's like cumulativity of data. And then the closure under union is not an assumption that we have to make. It's a consequence because uh, it turns out that the verifiable propositions defined as the propositions that if they're true, then you get verified, happen to be closed under account, right? So it's just a consequence. It's not something we assume. So what, what do we assume? I mean, we really assume just that, uh, that total ignorance is one information state and the, and informate, you know, and then, 
uh, we don't really use that the information states accumulate, but it's part of making sense of the uh, uh, um, what I call the plenitude principle, the plenitude interpretation. The plenitude interpretation and the definition of convergence that we use just don't make philosophical sense unless the information accumulates, but you never use it really in the proofs. So, um, and then look at what I did with the dots. The dots are not a Kuratowski uh, interior enclosure operator, but uh, in terms of how you think about them and reason with them, the dotted things work exactly the same. You get all the same results when you need them. And so everything that we tend to do in learning theory holds with the dots. So that, to me, that's like the big news. In fact, if you told me this, six months ago, I'd say it's crazy. You know, the, the, the dots thing really, I've only done uh, over the fall semester. And I, I would never have guessed. I mean, I always thought that uh, this almost sure business from Bayesianism is like oil and water to the topological reasoning. They, they don't fit together at all. I would have told you a beautiful story that these things would never get along together, uh, but I was wrong. They get along perfectly. And it's a way simpler way to understand all this stuff than going through complicated uh, probabilistic inequalities and writing long, long, uh, you know, lists of integrals. This stuff floats on top of it. That's just a way of getting into, you know, that's just manipulating a particular sigma ideal. It, it shouldn't be the top level understanding of what science is about, right? We want to. I really want now, you know, I'm getting older. I want uh, something that can really be like the way a young scientist understands what they're doing when they do real science, instead of being told a bunch of nonsense that they don't understand. Mm -hmm. And I think this has the potential, right? It's a, it's a pretty story. Yep. So sometimes you, you're forced into this awkward situation of saying, what is philosophy anyway? You know, is it just linguistics? Is it just human speaking behavior? I, I like to think of philosophy, and, and I guess this is a good place to close with the, the Russell theme. Yeah. Philosophy should be the linguistics of the future if you do a good job. That, that was Carnap's view. I think that's what Russell achieved. Uh, and that's the, that's the spirit in which I'd like this taken. I want this to be the way people talk in the future about what the point of science is. I don't want them to make science look bad by trying to load too many requirements on what it does. I want a true account of it that's simple and direct, that doesn't promise too much, and literally does what you say, and has a nice clean motivation that goes all the way back to Socrates. I mean, how can you beat that? Yeah, I think I, I really like that remark and the philosophy is the future kind of language to understand science and not only science. And I, I guess this is also a great happy ending for the <laughs> talk. So let, let's thank uh, Professor Kelly again <laughs> for the wonderful talk. Thank you. And um, yeah. I think this also concludes our series of online lectures on mathematical philosophy. Uh, so in the end, on behalf of the organizing team and the Department of Philosophy at Peking University, I would like to thank all of our distinguished speakers uh, and also all the participants who contributed to the sincere exchange of thoughts in all these lectures and all the recordings will be online. Actually, uh, we will do Professor Kelly's recordings, upload uh, the recordings of today. Um, so in the end, I, I, I really hope in the future we can bring you physically to our beautiful campus. I mean, the speakers and all the participants, um, of course, after this pandemic. Uh, so finally, I wish you a uh, Merry Christmas or a say peaceful lockdown. <laughs> and uh, we should have a great, great new year uh, next year. I mean, at least much better than 2020. So uh, see you in the future 
time for another season of mathematical philosophy lectures. Okay.